Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, what if an aircraft loses all communication with air traffic control and they cannot get the radios working? What could potentially cause that? And how could a flashlight help? Stay tuned. Wind 31016, everyone right? Right on. This video is brought to you in cooperation with Skillshare. Now, Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of high quality video courses in anything that you can imagine. Now, I know that you are sitting watching this video because you're a curious person. You like to learn things and that's where Skillshare really excels. For example, um, I'm a professional pilot, but I wasn't a professional YouTuber, so I needed to learn that. And a course that I have been using to become better, to give better stuff from me to you, is a course called uh, Authentic YouTubing with Sorel Amore. It's great to kind of highlight what you should be focusing on and what you shouldn't be focusing on. But I also use a, uh, a course with Howard Forder about how to fly an aircraft together with my little son who uses X-Plane 11. So that's a course for how to use your home simulator in order to prepare for your private pilot license and it's really, really fun to do. So those of you who are interested in trying this out, use this link here because you'll get two months of Skillshare, premium Skillshare, absolutely for free. And uh, you can try out whatever course you want. You can take part in the community work that they have. So you'll be working together with other people who are learning. And if you choose to go for the yearly subscription, it's very affordable. It's less than $10 per month. So check it out and let me know in the comments which is your favorite course and why. Right guys, so loss of radio. Now this is a fascinating subject and the way that I'm going to tackle this is that we're going to talk about first how air traffic control and pilots actually communicate with each other, the closed loop communication. Then we're going to talk about what different um, kind of radio equipment that we have and also what could potentially cause a loss of communication and what do pilots do if that happens. So make sure that you stay tuned to the end. So let's look at how communication works then. First of all, you have to realize that air traffic control and pilots, we communicate all the time. And it's extremely important that we do so because it's becoming more and more air traffic as we speak. There is general aviation, there is training aviation, there is commercial aviation with both passenger transport and cargo transport. And all of these have to work together in perfect harmony in order to maintain separation in between the aircraft so there's no risk of collision but also to maximize the use of the airport and the apron so it's extremely important that this communication works now the way that we communicate with each other is using a system called closed loop this means that both the sender and the receiver gets the same message and that both of them understand that the same message has been received so it starts with a sender sending a message to the receiver. So air traffic control will call the call sign, Mentor 360, climb flight level 350. We'll send that off to the aircraft. Now I read that back, Mentor 360, climb it to flight level 350. And in a perfect closed loop scenario, the sender, the original sender, then says, sends back just their own call sign in order to verify that the you know, both of us understood that the uh, communication was correct. So it's extremely important that both the sender and the receiver verifies the message uh, so that there's no confusion. Because if you think about it, when you talk to your wife, for example, <laughs> or your, your husband, and you tell them something and they go off and do something and come back with something different than you asked for them, that is a communication failure. That is happened because he or she did not read back what you said. So, Carl, go and get me some iced tea. And he comes back with a bumblebee. And you said, I didn't tell you to come back with a bumblebee, I told you to come back with iced tea. Oh, I didn't understand that. If he would have read back then, okay, I'm gonna go and get you a bumblebee. You would say, no, I want an iced tea. 
and this would never have happened. This is how the closed loop um, communication actually works, right? And that's how we communicate all the time. Now, what kind of communication equipment do we have on the aircraft? So on the Boeing 737, we have three different very high frequency transmitters and receivers, three COM radios. We have COM1, which is on the captain's side. Uh, that's where we do our primary communication. That's talking to our traffic control. We have COM2, which is on the first officer's side of the center pedestal. Uh, that's where we do secondary communication. So for example, taking weather, 80s involvement, uh, talking to engineering if we need to, or talking to our ops controllers. If we have, let's say we have wheelchair passengers on board and we need to prepare for that. And then we have COM3, which is on the back side of the center pedestal. Now COM3 normally is used for data link communication. Now, data link communication is something that we have just started with in my airline. And uh, it is communication from air traffic control to us through the FMC. So we get a ding, We'll go down, we'll look at the ATC button on the uh, FMC and see that there is a frequency change, for example. So this has been made as a system to, to uh, reduce the amount of voice calls because it's getting quite crowded on the frequencies now. Okay? But all of these three radios could be used separately for the same thing. So if we had a failure of COM1, well then we could use COM2 to talk with our traffic control. Both of those two fails, then we can use COM3 to talk to our traffic control. So this is a, a three-way backup. It's a very, very secure system. On top of that, if we're flying an aircraft that is used for flying Atlantic routes, uh, far away from land, we might also have an HF, a high frequency transmitter. And that is used because HF, since the wavelength is longer, will reach further. VHF is a fairly limited range. HF has a much wider range, and that's why it's used on uh, Atlantic routes. So that's the kind of uh, communication equipment that we have on board. What could cause a complete loss of communication then? Well, we're going to divide this into two things. So we're going to divide it into the most likely thing, the thing that happens almost every day at some part um, of Europe. And that's what we call prolonged loss of communication. Now, I've done a complete video about that. You can check it out. But we're going to go through it again a little bit in order for you to understand it. So as an aircraft is flying along a route, um, the aircraft will be talking to several different air traffic control units. The reason for this is that, like I mentioned before, the uh, VHF radios only have a limited range. So as we're flying along, let's say we're flying from the UK down to Greece, then we will talk to one controller and they will hand us over to the next controller, which will hand us over to the third controller continuously so that we always have contact with someone. But if we would be flying along and let's say that there would be a distraction because PLOC generally tends to be because of the human factor and most of the cases because of the pilot. So let's say that we, the pilots, are discussing something. Maybe we have a technical failure that we're focusing on and we're discussing, or we just have a really interesting discussion about something. And we would fly along. Air traffic control tries to reach us. Uh, we, we don't listen. We, we didn't hear it. Then eventually we will fly out of range of that controller. They will try to call us, but we won't hear anything anymore. And the radio will become eerily quiet. Okay. Now, if that happens... We have many, many standard operating procedures, SOPs, in order to keep that from happening. So, for example, um, on our route, we have waypoints that are associated with specific FIR boundaries. Those boundaries is when we should be changing over to the next controller. We take those boundaries and we put them in our navigation display as a fix. So we can see that there's a point there. And when we pass that, if we haven't heard anything, we contact our traffic control. We also listen to 1 to 1 decimal 5 on the secondary radio, on COM2. And 1 to 1 5 is the international emergency frequency. That means that everyone, all of the aircraft around and also the air traffic control units are also listening out on that. And if one unit cannot reach us, they can relay to a second unit that can call us. Or we can just call that frequency and we'll get into contact with someone who can then give us the correct frequency. All right? We are also doing what we call radio checks. If we haven't heard anything from air traffic control in 25 minutes, or if we haven't heard our own call sign in 25 minutes, well then we have to call them, do a radio check. And the way we do that is I call my call sign and the frequency I'm on. So Mentor 360 on 126.5 radio check. 
they will then come back and either switch us over because they've forgotten to do that or we will get a new frequency right now if we've completely lost all of that, we also have a en route map that we can take up. And on those en route maps, there are frequencies for the area where we are. So we can see where we are, we can check what frequency we should be on, and we can get that in and call them up. So there's several ways to keep that from happening. But say that we've missed all of this. We've been in a really, really interesting discussion. We've been focusing on something else. Maybe we've turned down the volume on 115, so we haven't heard how they're trying to call us. Well, then air traffic control have to assume that something nefarious is going on. They don't know if the reason for us not responding is because we have a failure of our radios or because we have been distracted or because someone is interfering with us. And the only way that they can find this out is they will contact the quick response aircraft, the quick response team. Now, that's the air force in the country that they're in. They will tell them that we've lost contact with this aircraft. They will dispatch, they will fly up and intercept the aircraft. All right. So this is where you've seen all of these YouTube videos of passengers filming out to the windows when there's uh, fighter jets around. They will come up on the left-hand side, slightly above us, and try to get our attention. Now, obviously, if that happens to any pilot, normally we would just throw ourselves onto the second radio, tune 115, get up the volume and ask, okay, uh, Mentor 360, we have a fighter on the left wing, please advise. And then, since they now get us into communication, they will tell us what's going on, tell us to contact a controller, we will do so. And if everything is fine, the fighter will just make a climbing left-hand turn and let us go on our way. Now, this is not great, right? This costs a lot of money. The airlines is probably gonna have to pay that so that you have a lot to answer to if that happens to you. Um, but the way that could also happen is that we actually have radio failure. Okay, but we haven't communicated it correctly yet. And in that case, especially if we've flown into an area maybe of military exercises or something like that, the, um, the, the fighter jet might tell us to follow them. And the way that they will communicate that is that they will come up slightly above to the left and they will rock their wings. Now, we are supposed to respond to that by rocking our wings as well. Now, this is the closed loop, so they know that we understand. And then they will turn, and we are supposed to follow them. Now, if we're in darkness, they will do that by um, blinking their navigational lights instead. And we then have to respond by blinking our own navigational lights, the red and green ones, out on our wings. And then we follow them out to the area. Now, there are also signs that they can give us uh, to where we have to land. There's a whole range of different signs that the uh, intercepting aircraft can give to us, um, but it's extremely rare. Most of the cases, they're only there to get us to reestablish radio communication, and then they will be out of our way. All right. Now, that's if we have made a mistake. Um, what if something happens that makes us lose all of our radios? That's extremely unlikely that that will happen because like I said, there's three, possibly even four different communication systems that we can use. But let's say that uh, a pilot uh, spills a full cup of coffee over the center pedestal and it actually shorts out our communication system. That could happen. What do we do? Well, as always, when it comes to commercial aviation, there is a procedure for that. We always have procedures to fall back on, even if the most unlikely thing will happen. And what we will do in that case depends a little bit on what part of, of the flight we're in. So if we take off and we're still in visual flight rules, in VFR rules, uh, the ICAO procedures, the International Civil Aviation Organization, Procedure tells us to maintain in visual um, conditions and land at the nearest uh, suitable airport. Now, in the case of commercial flights, it's unlikely that we will ever do that because most likely uh, it will not be practical to just return back and land. And in that case, we will follow the procedures for instrument flight rules and under radar control. And under radar control, the procedure tells us to do a couple of things. First of all, we have to call in blind. So whatever frequency we're on, we will call. We're going to obviously try all of the different radios. And then I will call Mentor 360, transmitting in blind, maintaining flight level 350 on heading 250 degrees. Like that. The reason we want to transmit in blind is because we don't know if it's just a failure of us receiving the signal. Maybe our traffic control can still hear us and we try to give as much information as we can. We will also um, put a new squawk code 
Um, there are three different emergency score codes that can be used. It's 7500, which is unlawful inf interference, hijacking. It's 7600, which is loss of communication, which is what we're going to use. And it's 7700, which is the emergency, general emergency code. And in this case, we will tune 7600. Now, that will send a message from our transponder to all the radar units out there that this aircraft has problems with communication. And since we're doing that, they will now assume that we're following the cow procedures. And if we're under radar control, the cow procedures tells us to maintain latest heading and speed and altitude for at least seven minutes. We're doing that so that the air traffic control units has time to rearrange traffic around us because they now know what we're going to do. After those seven minutes are up, then we can resume the flight plan because we have a filed flight plan. So we will just turn back onto our flight plan if we were on a radar heading and then we will proceed our route towards our destination and towards a predetermined fix. Could be the initial approach fix or it could be the final approach fix at the same altitude. So we're still at cruising level here. We'll go into holding over that point and then at our expected approach time, if we've been given one of those from our traffic control, maybe this was during the, the approach in that we lost the radios, for example, or as close as possible to our estimated time of arrival, our ETA, we will start our descent. And we will just descend in the holding down to the altitude where we will start the approach. We will shoot the approach and we will land. So the idea is that since we're starting this at our estimated time of arrival, we will land within 30 minutes of the estimated time of arrival. Okay, that's the procedure. So that's what air traffic control will expect to do. There are also local procedures. So if we're flying, for example, into one of the major airports in London, so London Stansted, there is a specific procedure for that airport. And me as a commander, I need to be aware what that procedure is. The way to find that is if I'm going to Ops Manual Part C, uh, there will be all air traffic control uh, instructions in there. So I'll just look up Stansted and I'll look up what the procedure is. And in case of Stansted, we have to go to a predetermined point, either um, Laurel or Abbott, which is if you're coming from the south or north. We have to go into holding over there for a minimum of five minutes under any circumstance. And then they expect us to start shooting the approach and go in and land, right? And these are different for all of these different major airports. So as a foundation, you have ICAO and then you have specific procedures for each airport. With me so far? Well, what about that uh, <coughs> flashlight that I was talking about before then? Well, the fact is that every air traffic control tower out there has a very strong flashlight that can be color coded and that's to be used in order to give instructions to an approaching aircraft or a departing aircraft. Now it should be said that these procedures are very rarely used and these flashlights are primarily to be used for general aviation VFR flights but it could be used for us as well. So if I come in on approach after I've followed these procedures and I look at the tower and the tower gives me a steady red light it means abandon the approach. Okay. If I get a flashing red light, it means that it's unsafe, which means I will probably also abandon the approach and go somewhere, maybe to an alternate. If I get an alternating red and green light, uh, it means take extreme caution. And then I could get a full green light, which is what I'm hoping for. And the full green light indicates you're clear to land, but always look out if there's anything else around because they still can't communicate with us. Now, a alternating green light uh, or flashing green light, it means if we have, let's say that we got a red light initially and we abandoned approach, then we went into holding pattern. If we're still visual then and we get a like a flashing green light, it means return to the airport and land. So there are different color codes depending on, you know, the situation around. But I would expect a steady green light with coming in having followed this procedure. And then we would just land. Taxi in, follow a follow me car obviously to the gate because we couldn't communicate where we we're going to go. And these are one of these circumstances where we have to write a, a report afterwards because it's something that affects the safety. It, it's fairly disruptive for a traffic control. It's going to um, command a lot of resources. So it's important that we write where this happened, why it happened and so on. Okay, good.
Now, if you have more questions about loss of communications, which I expect you do, as always, go in here, put them in uh, into the uh, comments field. I hope that you have subscribed to the channel at this point, that I have earned your subscription, uh, and also that you've highlighted the little notification bell, because I don't know if you notice it, but I've done more videos than normal these last couple of weeks, and the reason for that is because I am on unpaid leave at the moment. I am working only with the channel for the next two months, um, and that brings me to the next point, and that is a huge thank you to my Patreons, right? My Patreons out there, uh, you know who you are. You are the ones who are now, you know, supporting the channel, supporting me and my family as we are, you know, effectively without work for a few months. So a huge thank you to you. I have added more perks to becoming a patron. Um, for example, I've just created a Discord server that's available only for patrons so that you can communicate easily with me and I'll do some live streams there as well. If you haven't already downloaded uh, Discord, do so. You can just go into Patreon and you'll find the link so that you get to my Discord server. Also, if you're at the $10 or higher level, well then you will get premium access to the Mentor Aviation app, which means that you'll be able to ask questions during live streams, you'll have access to see the CVs of other users and you'll get access to stream special premium content that I make available only on the app. So thank you to all the help and all the support that you're doing on Patreon. It is hugely appreciated. And from all of you out there, come in and join us in the Mentor Aviation app. We have a fantastic community in there. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.